live in a world our ancestors would barely recognize. Around the globe, the impact of human ingenuity is now everywhere. We've pushed back the limits of our planet at speeds, depths, and heights that would have left our forebears breathless. Driving all these achievements is humankind's extraordinary gift for invention. Through genius and inspiration, we've created exceptional solutions to complex problems. From the everyday to the spectacular, some good and some not so good. This series celebrates the million ways our great inventions have transformed our world. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Every second of every day, pulsing beneath our towns and cities, our subterranean highways, transporting people and goods great distances, at incredible speeds. Over the centuries, it's transformed mass transit, altered landscapes. This was literally groundbreaking. And paved the way for engineering firsts. They couldn't go over them. They couldn't go through them. They had to go under them. From Victorian steam trains chugging through the first underground tunnels, to passenger-carrying pods, hurtling through vacuum tubes faster than the speed of sound. People are calling it the fifth mode of transport. This is the story of the invention of the subway system and the incredible concepts which will continue to transport us into the future. New York City. This concrete jungle is teeming with more than 8 million people, making it the largest metropolis in America. It's a global epicenter built on pace. But long before it became an iconic city, the Big Apple was under siege. From the mid-1800s through to the early 20th century, America's Industrial Revolution transformed the country. Innovations in steam, rail, and the textile industry thrust the nation into the spotlight. Nowhere was feeling this prosperity more than New York City. Thanks to its positioning as a major port, this young metropolis was fast establishing itself as a global hub for trade and commerce. And with that came mass migration. In just 70 years, the city's population had risen from 33,000 to almost a million. The city of New York was expanding rapidly. Business was booming, and it was a city massively on the up. If you wanted a job, if you wanted to get ahead, if you wanted to fulfill that American dream, New York was a city with all of those opportunities. But this boom in business and prosperity came at a cost, congestion. If you wanted to get around in Manhattan, you could either take one of the horse-drawn vehicles, public or private, or you could use your feet. The problem is, those two things are not compatible. The amount of traffic was incredible. And there's stories of people taking half an hour to cross the street because they just couldn't get through the traffic. With the congestion problem showing no signs of abating, New York City needed a solution. So at the time, there was no actual way of transporting people through the city en masse. And, well, that's what New York needed if it was to get any kind of relief from all these people on the streets. Under mounting pressure to reduce overcrowding, the local government turned to a mode of transportation that was gaining traction across America and the United Kingdom, the steam train. The first proper steam trains ran about 1830, both in the UK, Liverpool and Manchester Railway, and in America. So they'd been around about 40, 50 years by the time New Yorkers 
wanted to relieve their traffic problems on their roads. They did have a rudimentary steam-powered railway system, but it only served the outskirts of the city. There was nothing in the centre itself. And uh, they thought initially, well, can't we just run them like trams along uh, the main avenues, and found there was just too much traffic, too difficult, too crowded. A steam engine is incredibly powerful, but it's also incredibly hard work to run. It takes a load of people, a load of effort, and it produces smoke and steam and soot and all the other nasty stuff that you don't want blowing in your face as you're trying to get to work. Now imagine the steam in the middle of a town. Imagine it in people's spaces, in the shop fronts, in your houses. It just wasn't a viable option. To avoid clogging the metropolis with tracks and steam trains, engineers came up with a novel idea. The first thing that comes to mind when you think of New York is skyscrapers. They know how to build up. And so they thought, well, if we can build upwards with our buildings, why can't we put our railways up high too? Engineers proposed a series of railway tracks two stories high running through the city. It would be known as the Elevated Railway. The Elevated Railway brought the idea that instead of fighting your way through the traffic, you could fly nine meters above it on a specially created train on tracks of steel that took you above everyone else's head. In 1867, work on the new transport system began in earnest. The giant steel structures upon which the steam trains would run were made up of a series of columns and crossbeams. Positioned on top were girders to which railway tracks were attached. In 1871, New York City's first elevated steam train opened for business. Running along Greenwich Street, it was a roaring success. So the real answer to this growing population was to move everyone two stories up. And that became what essentially was the solution to transporting people around the city. In the following years, more elevated tracks were built throughout the city. As New Yorkers finally got moving, Across the Atlantic, London had been suffering from the same problem as its American neighbor. But a revolutionary solution was just around the corner. Much like rush hour today in central London, during the latter part of the 19th century, the capital was dealing with mounting congestion after its population had doubled in just 50 years. This caused huge problems with so many different parts of city life, but transport was one of the biggest. The typical forms of transport were horse-drawn at street level, things like stagecoaches, hackney carriages, and handsome cabs. It was an you know, incredibly crowded and sometimes quite hazardous environment, and life as a pedestrian was quite, uh, quite difficult. The large amount of horses led to a messy situation for harried Londoners. Apparently, three million tons of horse manure filled the streets. Just imagine walking through that on your way to your day job. With the city's population continuing to surge, the government needed to find a way to ease the crush. But unlike New York, building an elevated railroad system in the middle of this illustrious capital was out of the question. The architecture was too historical and too beautiful to be tampered with. And also, Londoners were a bit too posh to have something like that ruining their beautiful city. One Londoner who was all too aware of the congestion problems choking the capital was solicitor and social campaigner Charles Pearson. One of the rather eccentric parts of this story is that Charles Pearson, a solicitor, uh, not a profession that usually concerns itself with engineering. He was very anxious to see that London could spread further out. Did he have shares in a construction company? No. Did he come from a family of tunnel diggers? Not that I know of. He was just a solicitor who had a vision. And he realized that you couldn't build a railway on the surface because the roads were too crowded already and it would have involved demolishing lots of houses. Instead, Pearson put forward a bold idea, 
rather than building a railway line up above, why not go underground? At the time, there were very few tunnels. There was one built by Mark Brunel underneath the Thames, the, the world's first tunnel underneath a river. But essentially, uh, tunneling was really not a well-developed technique. Unlike Brunel's Thames Tunnel, which was used by pedestrians and as a tourist attraction, Pearson's proposal was for underground tunnels solely for mass transit. There was no transport system anywhere like this on Earth, so it was completely revolutionary. In 1853, Parliament approved a bill to construct the first subterranean railway between Paddington in the west and Farringdon in the east. Seven years later, work began. To build the underground tunnel, laborers used a method simply known as cut and cover. The cut and cover method is really what it says on the tin. You uh, cut a hole in the roads, uh, you make a big trench, uh, you lay in the railway tracks, and then you cover it over again, making it into a tunnel, um, and then the road is used again for the vehicles on top of it. So, you know, even today, uh, there's probably hundreds of thousands of uh, vehicles that go over the Euston Road, and people don't know that there's a railway underneath them. Remember, they were doing this without electricity, so it was a really simple but effective method. Throughout the 1850s, Despite work going at full steam ahead, word on the street was that no one would use this new subterranean mode of transport. You know, we're naturally afraid of confined places, of dark places, of rats, and, and all the images were conjuring up these things. Also, of course, the media, just like today, back in the 1800s, knew it would get more of a response the louder, the more sensationalist it was. And, and this provided not only a chance to kind of play on people's fears, but also this kind of fear of the new, fear of the unknown. But any fears were soon put to rest. On January 10, 1863, the first underground transport system in the world opened to the public. Named the Metropolitan Railway, it used steam locomotives, which ran along five and a half kilometers of line beneath central London. There was so much doubt about whether this solution would work, but then within the first year, 11.8 million people used this train system. That's over four times the population at the time. It was a total game changer. I think those first passengers, you know, would have felt like real pioneers. Don't forget, you know, people weren't traveling that fast, right? At that time, this was completely new. They would have felt like this was a new frontier for not just for themselves, but for humanity. The world's first underground was a hit. Over the next two decades, new lines were added and extensions built across the capital. Being able to rapidly expand the Underground Railway so quickly from the 1860s onwards was a massive engineering achievement. Thanks to the Underground's runaway success, throughout the latter part of the 19th century, construction of new lines dominated the city's roads. And that brought chaos. Cut and cover is a nice, easy method, but not when you try and do it in central London. So you have to disrupt everything to create these trenches. You have to knock down buildings. You might accidentally destroy something that's just been built, like Joseph Bazalgette's new sewers. Trying to do something like this in the middle of a busy residential city is always going to be a disaster. The roads were very crowded. There were now water mains, gas mains, and so on, which would get in the way, it was realized that the way of building underground railways through cut and cover was no longer feasible. London's underground was running out of room. Desperate to continue expanding, developers came to a bold conclusion. There was only one solution. They had to dig deep. But if engineers were to construct a network of new tunnels deep underneath the city of London, they'd need an entirely different approach. They needed a method that ensured you both progressed in the tunnel, you cut the tunnel, but also you shored it up straight away. To build the deep subterranean channels, 
engineers look to the man responsible for the Thames Tunnel, French engineer Marc Isambard Brunel. The story behind how he came to invent a groundbreaking piece of tunneling machinery started with an unlikely creature. So before Brunel built the Thames Tunnel, he was actually working in a shipyard. And it was there that he noticed this type of mollusk known as Teredo navalis, which is actually a kind of shipworm um, that would sort of burrow its way into the wood of the ships. It had a sort of hard shell around its head uh, that would dig its way through the wood. But then, geniusly, its excrement would come out the back and sort of line the outside of, of the tunnel so that it would maintain its structure and not collapse. Inspired by the actions of the Teredo Navalis, Brunel invented a vital piece of equipment which he used to tunnel under the Thames. It's named the Tunneling Shield. The tunneling shield was this huge rectangular structure laid up against the surface that you're trying to dig through. And it's split into cells. And each of these cells has one man with a shovel. And they busily dig away at that section. And when they've dug a certain amount forward, the next cell opens up. And that person digs away. And then the next cell, until that whole surface behind the tunneling shield has been dug out. And then the shield gets jacked forward and you start the whole process again. Meanwhile, another team of folks would go along behind the diggers, uh, bricking up the roof and the walls of the tunnel to ensure that it didn't collapse. So it was an incredibly efficient system of building a safe tunnel. Brunel's shield went on to pave the way for modern mechanized tunnel boring machines, which are used today in multi-million dollar projects all over the world. So it's amazing to think that these giant tunneling machines that we see today were just inspired by a little worm. Back in the late 19th century, as the London Underground's first deep tunnels were being built, Chief Engineer James Greathead helped to adapt Brunel's tunneling shield, making it cylindrical in shape rather than rectangular. This change gave birth to the first circular-shaped tunnels, as well as a popular nickname for the London Underground that today is used by locals and tourists alike, the tube. Engineers may have solved the problem of deep tunneling, but there was a health issue to overcome, the suffocating steam. Deep tunnels were fantastic, but what wasn't so great were steam trains. Imagine being trapped on a platform or inside a train where there's smoke and steam and heat and sulfurous fumes blowing at you the whole time you're on that transport. With deep level tunnels being narrower and much lower underground than their subsurface predecessors, it was clear to developers of the late 19th century that steam trains were no longer a viable option. You can't really have steam engines operating in very narrow tunnels uh, without much ventilation, uh, because uh, simply people would have uh, certainly coughed a lot, if not choked to death. But as luck would have it, in the 1880s, at the same time that these deep tunnels were being built under London, the country had been introduced to a revolutionary form of power that was transforming the lives of millions. Electricity. There was an element of luck and good fortune to the timing of being able to you know, tunnel at that sort of deeper level and the invention and practical use of locomotives in that railway. In 1890, when the City and South London Railway opened, at more than 12 metres below the surface, not only was it the first deep-level underground train in the world, but it was also the first major electrified subway line. Ironically, because electricity was in its infancy when the City and South London Railway first opened, most stations were still lit by gaslight. As for the new electric underground, power was supplied to the train line by giant generators based on Thomas Edison's dynamo motor. Located at Stockwell Power Station in South London, they generated enough electricity to power 14 locomotives. From the power station, the electricity was carried down the line via a third rail, positioned between the two existing rails. 
The electricity was then transmitted to the train through what's known as a sliding shoe, a device which collected the current from the rail and transferred it to the train. The new electrified tube line was a huge success. Other lines soon followed suit. Electric trains were an absolute revelation. They were faster, they were cleaner, they were cheaper to run, and they were so much more pleasant for the passengers. Electrified underground locomotives propelled transportation into the 20th century. But it's not just London where this revolutionary transformation was taking place. Cities such as Berlin, Paris, Budapest, and Boston were also opening their own subway systems, making them global leaders in underground mass transit. Meanwhile, at the end of the 19th century in New York, the once popular elevated railway, now abbreviated to the L train, was falling out of favor with the public. People started to dislike the L train because they were loud, they were big, they were puffing out steam and smoke right above your head, and it cast shadows all over the city. For New York to become the thriving metropolis that it is today, its tracks would have to go underground. New Yorkers heard that Boston, Paris, Budapest all had underground railways, and they had to keep up with the Joneses. But in addition to building their own subterranean transport network, the New York subway would go one step further. New York didn't just make their own subway system, they made it better than anyone else's. They learned from all the other cities that had a simple two-track system, one going one way, one going the other way. For New York, that wasn't good enough. They had to have four, an express track going fewer stations, much faster, and then two slower tracks. The big advantage of that is it allows trains to be express trains, skipping out some of the stops and going faster from one end uh, to another. If one train broke down, they had an extra track to be able to reroute trains and they wouldn't ruin every commuter's day. And also, you can close a couple of tracks for maintenance overnight, but keep the other ones open. So that's one of the reasons why New York has an all-night subway. On October 27, 1904, New York City's subway opened to great fanfare. Initially, the network had 28 stations. That figure has since exploded to 468, making it the largest subway system in the world. But today, maintaining New York subway, which connects the island of Manhattan to its surrounding boroughs, is no easy feat, especially when it comes to trains which run beneath the riverbed. To ensure that water doesn't leak into the system, more than 750 pumps are positioned beneath the tunnels. They run 24-7 to divert over 49 million liters of water into the surrounding sewers. Without them, the network would flood within a matter of hours. But it would take another technological innovation to allow global subways to expand. Back in the early 20th century, subway systems across Europe and America were growing at a rapid pace. More people than ever before were heading underground to get from A to B. But as more deep tunnels were built, a new problem emerged. Some of the underground stations had more than 100 steps. Imagine doing that every day during rush hour. It must have been so exhausting. Despite some stations being equipped with elevators, they had their limitations. A lift could only fit a certain number of people. It takes a while to wait for it to come up and down. Um, and obviously, being able to convey tens, hundreds, potentially thousands of people deep underground uh, at, at greater volume and at greater speed was a vital part of a deep level tube line working properly. If you've ever been through one of those few underground stations in London that still just have lifts as the only way, you'll know how miserable of an experience it is. You have to wait for ages to get in there and then when you do, you're all crammed in. And so that was the situation for everybody all the time trying to get the underground, not fun at all. So once the uh, tube railway started, uh, getting used much more heavily, 
uh, the bigger stations, the more popular stations, needed a better way to get people down and up from there. But there was a new piece of machinery in the works that looks set to take commuters to new heights, the moving staircase. We don't know for sure who the actual inventor of the escalator was, so we can't pinpoint it on anyone in particular. But we do know that in the 1850s, a chap called Nathan Ames patented an invention for something called revolving stairs. Ames's patent showed plans for a vertical walkway with steps mounted on a continuous belt, which would turn when operated. But of course, this was prior to the days of electricity, so in order to operate, it would have needed some kind of hydraulics or mechanical operation system, and as far as we know, no working prototype was ever built. Throughout the latter part of the 19th century, various designs and patents were submitted and prototypes showcased. We do know that there was uh, some kind of moving staircase escalator thing in Coney Island back in 1896, but as far as we know, it was more of a like novelty fairground attraction than an actual working escalator. It wasn't until 1900 at the Paris Universal Exposition that the idea of the escalator really began to gain attention on a global scale. Paris had a great world exhibition showing all the latest uh, inventions. And one of these that was displayed was a kind of flat escalator, what we'd now call a travelator, which basically people got on a sort of conveyor belt and were taken along without having to walk. You see people stepping on and stepping off and trying it out for the first time. It must have been so exciting to be one of the first people to try out this brand new piece of machinery. But the device that took the grand prize for innovation was Otis Elevator Company's escalator. Passengers were charged one penny to ride up and down the working model, resulting in thousands of people taking their turn on the motorized staircase. And it was this model that, well, gave birth to the escalator as we know it today. So an escalator is actually rather interesting. It's basically a conveyor belt, and it runs around two gears. Imagine two cogs, and the gear is run by an electric motor, and basically it goes round, round the gears. But obviously, it's an escalator, so it's tilted like this at an angle. At the bottom and top of the escalator, the stairs collapse, creating a flat platform for the user to get on and to get off. Soon after the Paris Exposition, Metro system bosses realized that the escalator could be the answer to commuters' woes and began installing them at their stations. The introduction of the escalator was really important to be able to convey large numbers of people deep underground. That technology really sort of transformed how commuting was experienced. By the 1930s, major cities across the world had their own subway systems, including Moscow. But while many global stations were designed with simplicity and function in mind, the Soviet capital had other plans. Under the rule of Joseph Stalin, prominent architects and artists were employed to design grand palatial stations in order to highlight Russia's superiority to the rest of the world. Today, many of these historical stations still stand, giving the feel of traveling through an art gallery or museum rather than a train station. Back in the middle of the 20th century, as many cities were expanding their subway networks, their routes were becoming more complex. Nowhere was feeling this more than London. In the 60 years since its first line opened, the number of stations had increased from seven to over 200. These stops were spread across eight different lines. But how to navigate this vast network presented new challenges that needed to be overcome. Despite having a map to help commuters get around the London tube network, many people still had difficulty making sense of it. The first tube maps were a bit of a muddle. They were actually really hard to follow for the average passenger. One of the problems with uh, the underground map is how do you represent it? Uh, how do you actually make it understandable? Because once you get more than three or four lines, it becomes very complex. 
and all these wiggly lines, you don't quite understand where you're going, where you're coming from, and so on. They showed parks, landmarks, and overground railway lines. And each line would show the actual curve that the tube line went in. Obviously, you know, reading maps is, is something as old as time, something that we all do. However, in order to feel comfortable doing it, you need the simplicity, right? So you kind of think of the classic compass, you know, which way you're going. It's simple, it's clean, it's clear. At that time, it was like dropping, you know, a bunch of spaghetti onto a piece of paper and saying, try and find your way around. Convinced there had to be a better alternative, in the early 1930s, one man took it upon himself to redesign the London underground map. Harry Beck was an electrical draftsman who worked for the London Underground. He very much did it in his spare time as a, as a kind of pet project and actually not being commissioned by the underground at all. It was his own idea and something that he was you know, very passionate about. Beck was inspired by the circuit diagrams he had to draw for work. He wanted to simplify the map. He wanted to design a map that didn't emphasize geographical accuracies and distance like its predecessors. Beck redesigned the map so that rather than being representational with all the squiggles and wiggles on that, the underground line, he made sure that only you only represented straight lines, 45 degree and 90 degree angles. So it became like an electrical diagram, much clearer and much easier to understand. Harry Beck took his map to the publicity office at London Underground, who were initially quite skeptical as to his uh, approach to the map. Um, but after some persuasion, they did initially try a trial uh, at selected stations. The public loved it. All 500s disappeared and they got tons of positive feedback. Following the trial run's success, the Tube's directors commissioned 700,000 copies of Beck's map to be distributed. They were so popular that they had to print another 100,000 copies just a month later. So it really speaks for just how important simplicity is in, in design. Beck received just over $50 for his initial work, which is approximately $950 in today's money. Due to its overwhelming popularity, his design soon became the official map for the London Underground. The wonderful thing about Harry Beck's design is that it survived uh, the difficulties of time. As more lines have been put on uh, the map, it's possible to accommodate it using his very simple system. The impact of Beck's map was huge, not just on London, but also graphically on other maps and other subway systems across the world. By the middle of the 20th century, as populations grew and cities developed, countries all over the world were expanding their transport networks. Commercial travel, be it by rail, ferry, or the increasingly popular airplane, was connecting people and places like never before. The notion that people can live somewhere and work somewhere else, the idea that this is open to the masses means that the connections we make, the size of our world, the, the openness of our minds is expanded. And so inevitably we're able to progress and move further. But little did the world know that a new idea was in the pipeline that was going to join two landmasses for the first time in history. In the 1970s, the European continent underwent a transformation with the establishment of the European Union, which Britain joined in 1973. Our links with Europe were growing, our trade with Europe was growing, but also, politically, you know, we were becoming a greater part of Europe. As Britain established itself as a key member of the EU, the need for a transport link to get people across the English Channel became a hot topic. Despite various ideas being put forward over the past 200 years, no such link had ever come to fruition. So you've got these two very important land masses. You've got the UK and you've got mainland Europe. And yet there's this annoying, narrow stretch of water separating the two. And the only way to get across it is either by plane or by slow ferry. There had to be a better way of doing it. 
The trouble is building a tunnel or bridge between France and Great Britain is uh, pretty difficult. It's very costly. We've had two world wars. Um, and we've also had reluctance by the military to allow a tunnel, which they saw might have been used by hostile forces. So all the early ideas were ditched. But in 1986, after a number of proposals had been submitted, the British and French governments agreed to construct what would become known as the Eurotunnel, a 50-kilometer railway connecting Kent in England to Coquel in France. Once up and running, trains would be able to travel at 300 kilometers an hour. But there was a problem. How do you convince the public that traveling inside a high-speed train through a tunnel 75 meters below sea level is safe. We have billions of years of evolution that say we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be traveling this fast in a confined space underwater, you know, meters and meters underwater. Yet, yet we are. So we're kind of in this sort of polemic between we wanting to progress, but just having these sort of, you know, genes that have been around for billions of years kind of going, we shouldn't be traveling this fast underwater in the dark. This is just odd. To allay any fears, engineers put forward an idea. Rather than build two one-way tunnels, they would build an additional service tunnel in the middle. Connected by cross passages, it would serve as an escape route in the event of an emergency. And of course, human beings are amazing because we anticipate everything we can go wrong, and then we find ways to, to kind of stop that from happening. In 1987, construction began. To cut through the chalk marl deep beneath the seabed, Workers operated gigantic motorized tunnel boring machines, modernized versions of the tunneling shields used 100 years earlier to build the London Underground. These machines also collected the debris, which was then transported along conveyor belts and up to the surface. In total, 4.9 million cubic meters of chalk was excavated. The newly dug tunnels were then lined with concrete to keep them waterproof. On December 1, 1990, construction workers from England and France bored through the final section of rock, connecting the two countries for the first time since the Ice Age separated them. As the champagne flowed in probably the biggest ever underground party, the Entente was very cordial. Four years later, the Eurotunnel was officially opened. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes, we will be entering the Channel Tunnel. It's the longest undersea tunnel in the world and is used on average by 22 million people every year. The construction of the Channel Tunnel was not only an amazing engineering feat, but also it has, to some extent, brought us closer together. The opening of the Eurotunnel may have strengthened the connection between Britain and mainland Europe. But in cities across the globe, as more people travel underground every year, subway systems are reaching breaking point. Tokyo is home to the world's busiest metro. With an average of three and a half billion passengers using it annually, a number equal to almost half the world's population. The city's main transport hub is Shinjuku Railway Station. With over 200 platforms, and an average of 3.5 million daily passengers. It holds the Guinness World Record for the busiest station in the world. So congested are some stations in Japan that subway staff have to literally push passengers onto crowded carriages. But it's not just Japan that's feeling the squeeze. Subway networks everywhere have become a victim of their own success. Despite some metro systems running trains during rush hour as often as every 100 seconds, overcrowding still persists. Many networks have set up 24-7 state-of-the-art monitoring systems to ensure the safety of passengers. Jam-packed platforms and carriages are a result of the same problem that was thwarting Victorian London in the 1800s, a population invasion. In the past decade alone, the number of people living in the capital has increased by approximately one million. While a mega 30 million tourists come to London every year, 
making it one of the most visited cities on the planet. London's population has grown enormously. Uh, people uh, tend no longer to be able to drive into central London because there's very restricted parking and there's so much congestion, so they take the tube instead. Um, and uh, it, it's become just very overcrowded and congested. To accommodate for this increase, over the decades, the London Underground has continually extended its network. But the city is still suffering. Nowhere can commuters feel this more than in the deep underground Victorian tunnels during the sweltering summer months. The tube tunnels are so small. And that really shows the, the changes in our times because there is no room for air conditioning. And what's so fascinating about being on the tube is dealing with the heat, heat from the brakes, heat from a lack of air conditioning. And you can really feel on those very hot, sweaty days on the tube that this is a very old, archaic system. Unlike previous decades, extending the current tube network is no longer an option. It is impossible to extend London's existing tube lines. Uh, they could not be widened because that would be far too expensive in terms of digging up the tunnels. You'd have to close them for many years. The platforms uh, are not long enough to cope with extra carriages. So what's the congested capital to do? London is now undertaking a grand tunnelling project, and it's the largest engineering project in Europe. In 2008, hearing the plight of Londoners, governing bodies for transport in the capital agreed to build an entirely new line. Commonly known as Crossrail, but officially named the Elizabeth Line after Queen Elizabeth II, it'll be deeper, bigger, faster and cooler than any line before it. Crossrail is a quite amazing engineering project with uh, 10 new or extended stations uh, underneath London with uh, platforms that have platform doors. The whole system is air conditioned. The stations will be real cathedrals compared with the existing uh, tube stations. Stretching over 100 kilometers, and connecting the suburbs of the west with those of the east, Crossrail will travel through the heart of the capital. Once complete, each train will be 200 meters long and will carry up to 1,500 passengers, almost double that of existing tubes. As for the tunnels, giant boring machines weighing 1,000 tons each have been used to build the subterranean channels, which at 6.2 meters in diameter are almost twice the size of existing tube tunnels. What's more, on some parts of the new line, passengers will be traveling 40 meters below the surface. That's 34 meters deeper than the original tube tunnels, which were dug using the cut and cover method. Despite still being under construction, once fully operational, London's ultra-modern brand new railway line is expected to serve 200 million passengers every year. Uh whole idea of Crossrail is completely different from the early tube lines. It's just on a much grander scale, and people will find it's a completely different experience from traveling on the early historic tube lines. London may have found the transport solution to its population growth. But what can engineers and entrepreneurs in other parts of the world do to relieve their ailing mass transit systems. What you really want is to completely revolutionize the system. Some innovators believe there's a way to increase speed and capacity like never before. What if we got rid of wheels altogether? But how do you get rid of wheels on trains? It isn't rocket science, but it was first imagined by one. In the early 1900s, physicist, inventor, and the father of modern rocket propulsion, Robert Goddard, envisioned a frictionless form of travel. Trains raised off their tracks by a process named magnetic levitation, now known as maglev. 
you've probably done the experiment where you put like two magnets together and if you get them in the right way, they, they repel one another. That's essentially what you're using in a maglev train. Um, you have magnets on the train, magnets in the track, and that keeps it hovering above. Over the years, Goddard's idea grew in popularity. Supporters believe that if these trains could be made into a mass transit reality, commuters in cities all over the world could get from A to B a lot quicker, which could also lead to increased capacity. The benefits of getting rid of wheels is that you eliminate friction because whenever two surfaces rub together, that causes drag and it makes travel extremely inefficient. And so his idea of using electromagnetic repulsion meant that you're eliminating surfaces that rub together, and so it's a much more efficient way of traveling. When it comes to maglev technology, Japan and China are already ahead of the game. The Shanghai Transrapid, which was built by German engineers, can travel at speeds of up to 430 kilometers an hour, making it the fastest train in the world. While in Japan, developers are working on a train to add to their existing maglev system, which, once complete, will be able to whisk passengers across the country at 500 kilometers an hour. But with the need for speed being the main goal, innovators believe they can take the principles of maglev and go one step further by reducing air resistance. One of the main obstacles to any form of high-speed travel is the surrounding air which causes friction, and in turn drag, to slow it down. So how do you reduce air friction? You put the train in a tube and decrease the air pressure. Enter Hyperloop. Hyperloop is about taking uh, all the benefits of, of maglev, but putting it in an evacuated tube. And because you're going through uh, this tube with very little air in it, you're pretty much eliminating most of the drag or air resistance. That means you can get up to much higher speeds. Essentially, it's a system of pods that transports people within a tube. Today, companies all over the world are vying to make this concept a reality. From Hyperloop transportation technologies to Elon Musk's SpaceX and Richard Branson's Virgin Group. Elon Musk described it as a cross between Concorde, an air hockey table, and a railgun. Passenger pod prototypes and vacuum tubes are being trialed at test facilities across the globe. If successful, the technology could transport passengers at tremendous speeds. Hyperloop could potentially get up to speeds of 1,300 kilometers an hour. That's faster than planes, and it's, it's even just a smidge faster than the speed of sound. To put that into context, you could get between LA and Las Vegas in just 30 minutes, which by plane takes some two hours and 45 minutes. And what we're seeing today with these modern Hyperloop structures being built above ground, it, it's almost taking us full circle back to the old elevated railways we saw in the 19th century in New York. With projects gaining traction, Hyperloop could be operating within two decades, paving the way for the next revolutionary leap in mass transit. I'm very interested in seeing if this takes off, if it is the way of the future. It's a pretty sci-fi concept. It'd be great if it works, um, but let's wait and see. I think these hyperloops, you know, as long as technology allows, are, are inevitable because there's not only a lot of resource being put behind this, but I think there's a lot of will in terms of being able to harness the amount of time that we have on this earth and make the most of it. In the past 200 years, thanks to the imagination of our most brilliant minds, subway systems have continued to develop, turning elaborate concepts into groundbreaking realities. These technologies connect cities and towns, transform landscapes, and above all, meet the demands of a thriving global population. If ideas like Hyperloop are anything to go by, it seems there's no end in sight for the future of mass transportation. Imagine being unable to cross this canyon or traverse this stretch of water in a boat. Now we have the ultimate solution. 
These are an incredible feat of engineering that seem to defy the forces of nature. There's two kilometers of road that's hanging with nothing underneath it. This revolutionary design provides lifelines to rural communities and joins up great towns and cities, connects islands like Denmark's Great Belt Bridge, and links countries like England and Wales's Severn Bridge, and even unites continents like the Bosphorus Bridge connecting Europe to Asia. They're some of the most beautiful structures in the world. They're iconic. To create these amazing structures, we have had to overcome immense engineering challenges and weathered failures to see them improve. So now they connect us, fuel our economies, and oil the wheels of the developing world. One bridge makes a massive impact. The root cause of poverty in those situations is broken. These engineering marvels are suspension bridges. Bridges come in many forms, but the most typical are the beam, arch, and suspension bridge. The UK's Severn Bridge is a glorious example of the modern suspension bridge, a triumph of complex engineering in an elegant form. It's a beautiful looking bridge. It stands out from the rest and it is quite unique. Always felt it would be nice to work on such a, an iconic structure. Um, and that's eventually when I did see the advert, I, I took that opportunity to work on it. And I've been here ever since, which is over 30 odd years. The Sem Bridge is a very simple, sleek, beautiful looking structure, but it's very complex in its design. But the roots of this complex bridge lie in the deep, distant past. One of the oldest known bridges is at the Sweet Track Causeway over bogs in the Somerset Levels, England. Simple log bridges originally constructed by Neolithic farmers nearly 6,000 years ago. A beam bridge is perhaps the simplest kind of bridge you can imagine. It's what happens if you get something solid and then just plonk it straight over whatever gap you're trying to bridge. The principle of the beam bridge is simple. Any weight compressing the center is transferred to its edges, where it is directed down through the banks or supports. It's effective, but only over short spans. The problem with a beam bridge is that you can only make them so long and they can only carry so much weight, because ultimately it depends on the strength of the material that you're using to make that beam. Once something gets very, very long and you put a large weight in the middle, then slowly that force, the compression, is going to just rip the material apart, the bridge will break and you'll end up crashing into the gorge. The solution is to shorten the span with central supports the way you can get around it is effectively to make a load of short beam bridges across whatever gap you're trying to bridge. And that means you have to put supports across that gap. This solution can be seen at Lake Pontchartrain in the American state of Louisiana. It is the world's longest continuous bridge over water, more than 38 kilometers long, and uses nine and a half thousand supports. The solution works in shallow water, but it's not so practical for deep rivers or vast canyons. Because you might have to make very tall supports if you're going over something particularly high, or you might have to build in the middle of a flowing river. So all of this makes building the bridge more difficult and more expensive. Three thousand years ago, engineers in ancient Greece improved the beam. This Arcadico bridge in the Peloponnese features an arch.
The Romans developed the idea a few centuries later and made glorious use of the arch throughout the empire. Arch bridges are stronger than beam bridges, spreading central load more effectively. Arches extend the maximum single span of a beam bridge from 20 meters to 30. But beyond 30 meters, engineers still have to add further supports. A bridge that could float, seemingly unsupported across wide rivers or deep ravines, still seemed beyond us. But the solution had, in fact, been with us for millennia. Rope bridges first appeared near the Himalayas at least 4,000 years ago. A simple design, ropes are attached to each side of a wide gap. Decking can be added to ease crossing. Unlike beam and arch bridges, the weight is transferred to the banks by the tension pulling through the ropes. Rope is something that's really strong in tension and this simple rope bridge takes advantage of that tensile strength. It means that all the forces acting on the rope are stretching it, they're pulling it, and that's how the rope supports your weight. Light and strong, rope can span longer distances than heavier materials without supporting pillars. But they're not for the faint-hearted. It moves around, so if someone's crossing ahead of you, it causes undulation on the back. So the structure is moving up and down. And of course, when you have wind, this also adds more movement. So the structure has a lot of movement that needs to be designed out. These unstable bridges are OK for people, but not for heavy traffic, like army or trade vehicles. When it comes to trying to get really heavy traffic across a bridge, like you know a horse and a cart or a lorry, then a simple rope bridge isn't enough. So the rope bridge, cheap, strong, and easy to build, was confined to small communities with light traffic, while the developed world relied on more sturdy beam and arched bridges to facilitate heavy traffic. It stayed that way until the late 18th century. And by then, the need was pressing. Across grand European rivers like the Thames, piers effectively blocked large shipping and small boats faced man-made rapids. London Bridge was for wise men to go over and fools to go under. Bridge piers tend to block part of the river, which means that the water flowing through the spans tends to speed up. And like most things, in a fluid flow, what we get uh, is eddies, and uh, we often get dangerous eddies coming off of bridge piers. That shooting through there, uh, you, you took your life in your hands at certain tides, simply because of the disruption that uh, multiple spans cause to the river. With fewer piers, large shipping could reach further upstream. This was the solution, the modern suspension bridge. The Severn Bridge linking England and Wales illustrates the benefits. The Severn Bridge is designed so that it gives you a clear shipping channel with a 47 metre headroom and enough width for large ships rather than a multi-span structure which would have multi-piers in the river which could be an obstacle and a danger to the structure if hit by shipping. If the link across this important shipping lane were blocked by piers every 30 meters, it would severely restrict shipping. The River Seven has got the second highest tide and uh, very fast currents, and therefore you need that space between the two towers to allow safe shipping access to sharp neck stocks. The secret to the suspension bridge's ability to span far greater distances than beam and arch bridges is also part of its elegance. It's only by traveling to the very top 
a place where the public are never allowed to go, that you can appreciate its true scale. You can see from the scale how big the crossing is on that clear span of 988 meters with glorious views in both directions. But how does this bridge manage to span such an enormous river? The breakthrough happened in America at the beginning of the 19th century. The inspiration came from merging two of the most enduring bridge designs. So you've got your conventional beam bridge, which, yes, that will span a gap without a support, but is limited above a certain width. And then you've got your rope bridge, which can span a larger gap, but is really, really wobbly, so that's no good. So is there a way that you can combine the two together? The breakthrough came in. No image exists of the genius behind the plan, James Finley, but there is a surviving sketch of one of his early designs. Instantly recognizable, Finley designed a chimera, half beam, half rope bridge, with the advantages of both. The real revolution in suspension bridges was when they realized you could make the deck flat and rigid. And that meant that so much more heavier traffic could travel across the bridge and they became infinitely more useful. The weight carried by a beam bridge, normally transmitted downwards through piers, is instead transmitted upwards through suspension cables. The flat deck is supported all the way along. That distributes the weight throughout the entire bridge, and it means that the forces are balanced in a way that keeps it flat, keeps it up, and doesn't put too much pressure on any single part of the bridge. The modern suspension bridge is deceptively clever. You take a flat bridge, but instead of supporting it at either end or from underneath, you support it from above. But the new design wouldn't work unless the suspending cables were made of a material capable of carrying the heavy loads. And that material wasn't available until the end of the 18th century, when the falling price of wrought iron in the US made the design affordable. The idea of using iron to create super strong chains came from the Chinese. Initially, they were using rope, but the Chinese came up with this idea that if they heated iron ore, they could bend iron into the shape of links, chain them together, and you'd have a material that was able to take a much greater weight. Back in the 1430s, a Tibetan saint named Thang Tong Gyalpo built the first iron chain bridges. The bridges have since been replaced with reconstructions, but they still use some of the original chains. James Finley upsized the Chinese design to take advantage of cheap wrought iron, each chain weighing over 10 tons. His revolutionary design became the first modern suspension bridge. The genius of the design isn't immediately apparent. If Finley had simply attached his suspension cables to bankside towers, the tension would have pulled them down. The towers seem like a great idea until you think about the forces acting on them. If you had a tower on each bank, all the force, all the tension from that chain is coming from the middle of that gap. And that means it's going to be pulling both of those towers inwards. And potentially, if they're not really, really solid, it's going to cause them to collapse. So imagine instead of having that cable just pulling on one side of the tower, you stretch it all the way over the top and bring it down to the bank on the other side. The suspending cables are anchored beyond the towers, splitting the tension between the ground and the bridge. That means you've actually got tension acting in both directions. And that then means the tower, the forces are balanced. It's not being pulled either way. And that means it's stable and won't fall over. The same principle is still used today. 
In Chile, these gigantic concrete anchors spread the strain over the towers. On the Chao Cao Bridge, uh, we're using a mass anchorage, so it actually relies on its sheer weight. So we have a very large 120,000 ton concrete mass at the end rather than uh, a small tunnel. From the 19th century to the largest structures of today, all suspension bridges follow Finley's design, allowing flat, rigid roadways which can carry modern traffic spanning vast distances. This modern suspension bridge is critical to developed cities, but it's also of vital importance to remote communities across the world. The need for suspension bridges in, in rural communities where people are so isolated is acute. If you imagine living in those kinds of environments where you've got to walk miles and miles to get to anything, a river, particularly a river that floods, is a major obstacle to any kind of opportunity. And the result is people remain in poverty. If you think about it, isolation means poverty. If you can't get to market, you can't get to school, you can't improve yourself and others can't get to you. I've actually seen children holding their school books above their heads and wading, holding their breath as they actually have to get their head under the water to wade through the river on the way to school. It enables others to get to the community, not just the communities to get to places, but so other charities, other aid workers can get to, to the people who need them. One bridge makes a massive impact. huge change to the lives and livelihoods of those people, and in fact, to the economy as a whole. That tyranny of isolation, which is the cause, the root cause of poverty in those situations, is broken. So that now opportunity exists. These modern bridges now span rivers around the world. But the early bridges were far from perfect as a fatal tragedy demonstrated in Great Yarmouth in England. It's 1845 and a huge crowd of families and children have gathered to see a circus performer. The best place to view this performance is on the bridge. And as they saw the performer traveling down the river, everyone rushed to one side of the bridge, which created an enormous force on the chains. And unknown to anyone, there was a weak link. That weak chain broke and caused a catastrophic failure of the entire bridge. 79 people died, many of them under the age of 13. And as the bridge collapsed, people were crushed or thrown into the water. It was a heartbreaking tragedy, and it meant that suspension bridges had to be rethought. There had to be a better way than this. This tragic incident highlighted the limits of the iron chain design. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. It just takes a single one of those links to be in some way not structurally sound, and then it can snap, and the whole chain has completely lost all of its tensile strength. It was clear that the iron chain suspension needed an upgrade. Engineers searched for something stronger and lighter. The answer isn't immediately apparent on the Severn Bridge because it's encased in a protective sheath. But deep underground, where the bridge is anchored, you can get a glimpse of the modern solution. Inside their rust-proof dehumidifying tent, you can see that the thick, heavy iron chains have been replaced with thousands of thin, super light steel cables. We're now inside one of the main cable anchorages on the Sem Bridge, where we've got the main cable, which consists of 8,322 individual wires, making up the bundle. This then splits up into these small bundles, which are anchored around the, the shoes. 
like all modern bridges, the Severn Bridge benefits from safety in numbers, with bundles of thin steel strands acting like super strong rope. Cables are strong under tension and you can use several together. So if one snaps, there are others to take over. A failure is no longer catastrophic. The use of cable has made bridges safer. But bridge builders faced many deadly challenges, some from completely mysterious forces. In America, the East River separates Brooklyn and Manhattan. At points, it stretches over a kilometer wide. For many centuries, the only way to cross had been by ferry. In the 1860s, a new suspension bridge promised to change all that, the Brooklyn Bridge. It was designed by a German immigrant, John Augustus Roebling. Too wide for a single span, it was inevitable that one of the towers had to be built in the river. Perhaps the single biggest problem of working underwater is that we can't breathe underwater. So if all your construction is being done by hand, then there's just no way that you can get people down there digging up the riverbed trying to put those foundations down. So what you need to do is provide them with a protective atmosphere that they can work in. And the way that this was done is with a device called a caisson. A caisson is a large diving bell. It allows workers to breathe and keep setting concrete dry underwater. You can think about a caisson like trying to push a cup down in the bath when it's upside down. So it's full of air, and then as you push it underneath the water, that air stops the water from rushing in. It's a protective atmosphere for your workers. But as the caisson drops, the pressure forces water into the bell. So in order to keep that water out, you have to apply more pressure by pumping air into that caisson to make sure that the water stays outside. And the only way to stop the whole structure just crumpling is to make sure that the pressure on the inside balances the pressure on the outside, so there's no force on the walls and they can stay intact and keep your people inside safe. The caisson makes construction possible, but it's quickly apparent that something is wrong. The workers return to the surface unwell, some even die. Is the air inside the huge underwater casing poisonous, or is there some deep water virus? The mysterious illness seemed to defy explanation. Sending workers down under the water had an effect on their bodies that no one could have predicted, and no one really understood. In fact, it was a simple physics problem. At high pressures, more of the air we breathe dissolves into the blood. This isn't immediately dangerous until you return. The problem isn't so much working at high pressure for long periods of time, it's when you come to the surface that the problems happen. That dissolved gas tries to expand back into its gaseous form, and if it's still in your system, that can cause blockages that could be fatal. Today, Caisson's disease is known as the Benz and is a constant danger for divers. But back in 1870, Brooklyn, the phenomenon was little understood. As a result, the designer's own son, Chief Engineer Washington Augustus Roebling, was permanently disabled by it, and at least 21 men died. Tragically, it was only after construction that scientists discovered how to prevent it from happening. When you go from a highly pressurized environment to normal atmospheric pressure, it has to be done with time because that allows for any bubbles that have formed in the blood to dissipate. Decompression helped to save the lives of future caisson workers and divers. Safety procedures were brought in for later construction projects, like the tunnels under the Hudson River in the early 1900s. Let's join a crew of sandhogs as they start on the day's job under the river. They must stay in the airlock a few minutes until the air pressure is built up to equal that in which they will work. It is different when they return from work. Then they must be gradually decompressed, which takes a much longer time. This whole process is for the protection of compressed air workers. But even with these precautions, the process is still dangerous. 
So these days, the risk is eradicated by using technology to replace workers to build underwater foundations. But the challenges facing suspension bridge engineers are far from over. And it's not just how they're built, but where they're built. In 1906, an earthquake devastates San Francisco. Up to 3,000 people die, and over 80% of the city is destroyed. The stone buildings can't withstand the 7.9 magnitude shake. This disaster makes it essential to earthquake-proof future building. Two decades later, San Francisco plans to build the first bridge ever to cross the Golden Gate Strait, spanning over two kilometers. In the early 1930s, the city of San Francisco is a major trade center, yet it's isolated from the rest of California to the north. Besides boats, they're cut off. But a suspension bridge requires towers that would eclipse all the city's skyscrapers, reaching over 200 meters high. To make the strongest possible suspension bridge, there's a very particular shape of cable that you want to get to optimally distribute those forces. And what that means is that as you make your span wider, you're going to need to make the towers taller to compensate so you can keep your cable in that special shape. The stone towers of the Brooklyn Bridge would no longer be suitable. They would be too tall. And stone would be particularly unstable in an earthquake zone. A stone pillar, um, as it gets taller and taller and taller, uh, the mass of the stone will crush the stone below. So there is only a certain height that you can go to. For the San Francisco Bridge's chief engineer, Another German descendant, Joseph Strauss, it was clear he needed a completely different design. Once again, a breakthrough in technology comes just in time. Advancements in metallurgy bring about a new affordable material, steel. The mix of iron and carbon creates a strong but lightweight alloy, far more flexible than stone. Box girder towers of massive strength carry the strain of huge cables in many modern suspension bridges. The new bridge will span an earthquake zone. So it must be compliant or flex. That is naturally compliant, it will move. That movement is important that that movement allowing that movement means that you cannot build up stresses within the material to the level at which that material will then subsequently fail when subjected to the forces of nature materials need to absorb them and allow the energy to pass through compliance prevents materials from getting damaged under stress if you think about a blade of grass in a gust of wind it will it will give. It doesn't permanently give. The, the grass will spring back into place. You haven't broken the grass by blowing the wind across it. It's just kind of allowed the wind to blow over it. So if we compare, uh, let's say, an oak tree and you have a gust of wind, uh, then that structure can't comply. And as a consequence, as the, the force of the wind pushes up against the, the tree, um, all of that force has no way of being relieved. And as a consequence of that, uh, could exceed the actual tensile strength of the tree itself. And the tree could snap, literally snap. And so in 1933, construction begins. And the iconic steel towers of the Golden Gate Bridge rise up. Instead of creating a heavy, solid tower, the steel creates a honeycomb lattice structure which is lighter, but still strong enough 
that each tower can support a 60,000 ton load. Although this bridge was designed to be safer, construction comes with a human cost. Working at these heights is extremely dangerous, and 11 men lose their lives. But the death toll could have been much higher. Incredibly, 19 other people were saved when they were caught by nets as they fell. This was also the first bridge to insist on workers wearing hard hats and safety lines. It was a big step towards the greater protection that construction workers enjoy today. At the same time, an almost identical steel design to the Golden Gate is used for the Oakland Bay Bridge, just around the corner. The bridges stand proud for decades, until they are finally put to the ultimate test in 1989. The earthquake causes heavy damage across the Bay Area, though less severe than 1906. It causes $6 billion of damage and kills 63 people. Roads and bridge decks collapse, but not the suspension bridges across the Golden Gate or the Oakland Bay. The West Bay Bridge, which is the suspension bridge, uh, nothing happened. The suspension bridge is very good as in earthquakes, very little happens to it. The 1930s design was so effective that the suspension bridges still stand strong today. But earthquakes are not the only natural force engineers have to overcome. They face a problem related to rope bridge ancestry. As decks get longer, they become more vulnerable to a phenomenon all too familiar to the original suspension bridges, swaying, sometimes with dramatic results. Three years after the Golden Gate's construction, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington is opened in 1940. This bridge was designed to safely withstand 225 kilometer per hour gales. What happened next should have been impossible. The result of a comparative 65 kilometer per hour breeze. An amateur cameraman captures this incredible footage as the center of the 11,000 ton span twists like a ribbon in the wind. The oscillations become life-threatening and the bridge is evacuated. But one man stays. His dog is trapped in his car, and he doesn't want to leave it. Despite the dangers, there's little sign of panic, as no one seems to recognize the stress the bridge is under. The man decides he has to leave his dog in the car for now. The twisting weakens the bridge, until it can take no more. It's incredible that no human lives were lost when this bridge collapsed, but it was so close. But imagine if this bridge had been full of commuters early in the morning, dozens and dozens of cars. They could all have been thrown off into the river. It could have been an enormous human tragedy. No one understands how it happened. This bridge was designed to withstand high winds and air turbulence, but the incident happened at a relatively low wind speed. So the engineers had a challenge. They didn't know what they'd done wrong. Why would this bridge collapse when it should have withstood those forces easily? Had scientists got their calculations wrong? The Tacoma Narrows disaster sent shockwaves through the engineering community. Was this a fundamental design flaw in suspension bridges? And did it affect all of the bridges around the world? Any person who'd ever built a suspension bridge was sitting there thinking, well, damn, is this going to happen to my bridge? And as a result, building of all suspension bridges was put on hold for nearly a decade. The 
pressure was on to explain the seemingly inexplicable. The situation is rather complex, and for many years there was some argument as, as to what caused the bridge collapse um, and how, in fact, it did collapse. Most experts now agree that Tacoma Narrows failed um, as a consequence of aeroelastic flutter. Flutter is something that all aerodynamicists are very worried about. You build an aeroplane, then it's tested against this, this form of oscillation movement. Flutter is a dangerous instability caused by airflow over the deck. Basically, what happens is as a sustained wind is blowing from one particular direction, it starts sort of creating uh, these, these air currents, these sort of vortices and eddies um, on, the, on the leeward side of the bridge, on the, on the side where the wind is passing over to. And over time, these, these, these vortices start sort of getting underneath and over the bridge and starting to sort of make it swirl a little bit like this. And the more it does it, the more these forces grow and it sort of starts getting stronger and stronger until this motion is unbelievably exaggerated. As the eddies push and pull at the bridge, they strengthen. If the timing of the swing matches the bridge's resonant frequency, the structure oscillates violently. Everything has a natural resonant frequency, so that's a frequency at which you can wobble it, and that wobble will continue to amplify. Under specific conditions, the movements build upon each other. So what the wind was kind of doing was it was behaving like, you know, an adult pushing their kid on a swing. It just kept applying a little bit more force at just the right time to get it going until it was getting really, really out of control. The bridge hadn't been designed to resist this vertical flutter. The engineers had considered the horizontal force of the wind trying to push the bridge over, but they hadn't considered the vertical forces, things like the lift, which pushes it into the air. And because of those additional forces, it meant the bridge was being pushed up and down, up and down to the point where it could get into this resonant groove until it amplified and amplified, and the bridge collapsed. How could they engineer the structure to prevent the eddies from forming? It wasn't until the 1960s that they found the answer. For decades, there had been a pressing need to build a bridge across the River Severn, a road bridge that wouldn't just connect two cities, but two nations. England and Wales. Cars going from Bristol to Cardiff had to cross by ferry. The Severn Bridge became the first bridge designed to overcome the oscillation problem. The engineers had a radical solution. For inspiration, they had looked to the sky. Designers realized that instead of fighting the wind, they could use it. Plane wings have an interesting sort of fact about them in that they, they're shaped in order to provide lift. And the problem that they had with bridges in wind is that they wanted the opposite. They wanted a downward force to keep the bridge stable. And so what did they do? They just kind of copied the design of aircraft wing, but turned it upside down. Structural engineer Bill Brown's design turned the bridge deck into an inverted plane wing. Called a box girder, the deck is aerodynamically shaped to create stabilizing air pressure. So basically, the, the bottom side of the bridge would have a curve, while the top of it would be flat. And this, uh, this lowered air pressure down here uh, would mean that the bridge would have a downward force acting upon it. The box girder decks are hollow allowing interior access for maintenance and an exclusive glimpse inside the labyrinth of tunnels directly underneath the bridge. This is a typical bay in a box girder bridge with a generic aerodynamic shape. It's very lightweight steel, it's chip building construction with very thin plate with stiffening. The SEM bridge was the first bridge to use this aerodynamic shape. From there, everybody is using this for their suspension bridges. 
The bridge's bold innovation was world-changing, stabilizing long-span bridges. This solution was the breakthrough that the engineers were looking for. It was a leap forward in terms of suspension bridge design and enabled them to build bridges spanning gaps previously thought impossible. The Severn Bridge set the standard, but the challenge is greater in typhoon regions. When you're building bridges in places like Hong Kong, China, South China Sea, typhoons, of course, are a major design parameter. You've got to be dealing with some very, very strong winds. To survive typhoons, the Shenzong Link in China has made use of a clever twist on the old design. In high winds, the traditional box girder can't always stabilize the deck. The wind impact in those inclined surfaces may actually have the opposite effect, to push it up. So it's quite a complicated design uh, exercise when you're doing this to get that balance right, so that the lift forces are carefully controlled. The solution for this is to split the box girder deck into two parallel decks with a space between them. The gap reduces the impact of the wind. There's an air gap down the middle. What that air gap does is it equalizes the pressure, or it helps to equalize the pressure top and bottom so that you don't have such big dynamic forces to deal with. But more radical is the positioning of the main suspension cables. Instead of running parallel either side of the deck, they run down the center of the deck, above the gap. The cables start out at the top of the towers on the center line, but as they come down to the bridge deck, they splay out and they pick up the deck on the outside. Got a sort of triangulated cable system. So when the wind blows, the bridge deck, when it tries to move sideways, is more um, resisted. The movement is more resisted by this arrangement. So the Shenzong Link is designed very much with the aerodynamic and the wind load situations in mind. Despite all the advantages of steel suspension bridges, they have an Achilles heel. It's Mother Nature's ultimate corrosive challenge to engineers. Rust, an insidious creeping problem suffered most in humid areas particularly near the sea. To try to prevent rust, bridge builders paint the metal, but water can get under the paint and destroy the structure from within. It has this terrible tendency to corrode. Uh, and there's very little we can do about that. It's nature having its own way. It's critical to spot this corrosion before it becomes dangerous. But this is no mean feat. Suspension bridges are very large structures. Um, they have towers that are high in the air. They have cables that are, are high, usually over the sea or a river. Uh, and often it's windy and it's rainy. Um, it's a very difficult thing to access, but inspection is a, is a very difficult uh, and really quite a dangerous activity. So incredible gravity-defying robots have been designed, which can cover every inch of bridges above and below. Maintenance robots aren't just looking for corrosion. They can also spot signs of otherwise hidden damage to the bridge. In the past, bridges have collapsed because of weaknesses in the structure. Future technology may prevent collapses and help us have the confidence to build bigger and more ambitious suspension bridges. Perhaps the most innovative design is by engineers from Norway, which would take suspension bridges to the next level. Norway is a country that's dominated by waterways and there is constantly this engineering conundrum of trying to join up islands. And rather than using the conventional technique of drilling foundations down into the fjords, which would be a really difficult task, they've come up with a much more novel way of creating bridges. Instead of sinking deep legs for the towers, they are inspired by an industry that is no stranger to deep sea construction. These oil rigs have no solid foundations. Instead, they float. 
It's almost a sense of repurposing engineering. Floating oil rigs have been successful, and now Norway is using that concept to be able to create floating suspension bridges. If they make the base of the towers sufficiently buoyant, they can support themselves and the weight of the multi-thousand ton bridge deck. And it's kind of elegant that actually, in the end, the way to, to span a bridge of water is to end up floating on it. But there's a catch. If you have a, a floating tower, now that brings up the old problem of instability, because of course you don't want your bridge to be able to start rocking and moving or going with the tide. The solution is in precise anchoring. So you have some tension cables which are anchored into the bottom of the field, and you then pull this thing down so it's just below the surface. So you've got this buoyancy force, which is trying to lift it, it's trying to float, but it's held down. And that becomes a platform just below the surface of the water on which you can build your bridge. Just like oil rigs, as long as the anchoring cables are tight and secure, the floating structure will hold steady, even in heavy weather. But if the anchors were to fail, the repercussions would be serious. To work, these bracing tethers would have to perfectly balance competing forces to ensure stability without too much flexibility. Extraordinary technology, uh, very complicated, very difficult to deal with, and of course it's still in its infancy. But what it does, it suddenly opens up the possibility to be able to bring, build bridges across places that we hitherto have just not even been able to conceive of doing because the water's just too deep. So we'll see where it goes, but I think floating suspension bridges are a really exciting development. Suspension bridges have a bright future and will continue to push the limits of engineering. Since the modern suspension bridge was invented, their span has roughly doubled every 50 years. So I'm so excited to see just how wide of a gap we can bridge one day with a suspension bridge. And who knows, one day we might be able to do away with the majority of boats because actually we can connect most islands to, to each other or to the mainland just by beautiful suspension bridges. But not all bridges will be so complicated. There's still a need for cheap, simple bridges. Though these may well be delivered with a twist of the high tech. And now more than ever, suspension bridges can unite communities and enable people to thrive in both cities and remote regions alike boasting iconic designs, which have evolved to span further, carry more, and survive earthquakes, tornadoes, and corrosion. And admirers will continue to celebrate their scale and majesty in every kind of way. This is the center of the global economy, a transshipment hub for goods, from mobile phones to bananas to the clothes we wear. We got to experience products that would never have reached us. On a daily basis, millions of tons are shipped across the oceans, and millions of tourists reach every corner of the globe. The extent to which great technological inventions transform this spot is all but unparalleled. It once inspired yearning, it was the gateway to the world. It was people from different communities, from different countries, connecting and speaking. This was sort of very, very important. Today, it brings the world home to us, and this at breathtaking speed. The technology involved in making that smooth and quick and efficient is mind-boggling. For the longest time, muscle power was very much in demand here. What counts today is technological know-how. But having something that can just go and then stack it up, I'll save a lot of time. Automation has made people's work easier. And at the same time, it has made them obsolete. Well, the main question would be, where are the people? It has dramatically changed our view of the world, the way we travel and the way we consume. It was, is, and will remain the impulse generator for our future, the port. Rotterdam, 
about 30,000 ocean-going vessels, including gigantic container ships like the Mastel Mask, call to port here year for year. Some 60 meters wide and 400 meters long, it is among the world's largest vessels. Its cargo, almost 20,000 containers. At the port, the clock is now ticking. Time is money here, a lot of money. Man and machine toil away. In the global rankings, however, the port of Rotterdam only came in 11th. Competition is, uh, is getting harder. So our customers, they, they always typically want the, the, the lowest price. So, so we have to be as efficient as possible to actually be able to offer competitive uh, prices. Uh, they want the vessels in and out. Our productivity should be extremely high. So we have to be as efficient as, uh, as possible. A global problem that logistics is trying to address with cutting edge software. Every minute, 10,000s of containers need to be distributed. The ship is often unloaded simultaneously. To avoid lengthy and expensive restacking, ship planners meticulously organize the processes on their computer. Color coded boxes are moved virtually and allocated to the appropriate warehouses. We see where the container is from, what size and weight it is, and where it is to be discharged. It is either discharged here, or in Asia, or South America. We prepare the plans on our computer system, so our counterparts on the outside can continue working with it. The competition is stiff. If ports don't meet their customers' needs, ship owners will simply call at a different port. What's at stake today is time, and efficiency and cost. And we are dominated by price wars more than we think. Two thirds of all goods are shipped by sea because it's one of the cheapest ways of transporting goods. And so our waterways, our oceans, our seas are filled with containers that are shipping goods all over the world. The history of ports and maritime trade is inextricably linked with the cultural history of humankind. Man has always endeavored to transport goods across the ocean. The first trade ship goes back to the Phoenicians. As early as in the third millennium, the first artificial ports were constructed. They went on extended mercantile expeditions during which they founded numerous colonies in southern Europe. Apparently, the city of Malaga was also founded by Phoenicians. During the Middle Ages, maritime trade greatly influenced the development of cities. Hanseatic merchants in Northern Europe joined together as a confederation. This so-called Hanseatic League encompassed up to 300 seaside and inland towns. Most of the towns were located in an area that would today reach from the Netherlands to the Baltic states and from Sweden to central Germany. In the 16th century, from this base, the Hanseatic traders created a sphere of influence that would span most of today's Europe. The economic success of the League was primarily owing to their powerful fleet of trade ships, known as Kongs. The Hanseatic League um, was sort of regulating the trade between cities in the northwest and northeast of Europe. So you had things like copper um, and other metals from Sweden, um, skins and furs from Russia, uh, wine and other nice things from the Rhineland. Um, so it, it sort of resulted in these very um, affluent for the time uh, cities popping up on, on the coasts of Northern Europe. Hong Kong's international reputation as one of the most important commercial centers is also down to its harbor. Victoria Harbour was crucially important for Hong Kong's development. Apparently, this is also why Hong Kong was claimed as a crown colony by Britain in 1843. Hong Kong Harbour is a natural harbour lying in the South China Sea between the Hong Kong Islands and the Kowloon Peninsula. British merchants quickly recognised the harbour's potential for their trade fleet. It offers everything you'd expect from a natural harbour a deep water bay that is protected from strong waves and furnishes safe anchorage. 
In the foreground is the beautiful natural harbor, where the large liners and men of war look like toy ships in a child's bath. And in the distance, the mountains of China. Thanks to its strategic location in close proximity to the Chinese mainland, the harbor quickly evolved into a center for trade with East Asia. Victoria Harbor in Hong Kong um, was hugely important. It was um, kind of the main port for sort of a lot of the colonies. We could see kind of the British sort of trading through there. Victoria Harbor soon emerged as one of Asia's premier ports. Up until the 1970s, many shipyards and trading companies settled here. Hong Kong had become an important outpost of the British Empire. In Hong Kong, the decisive impulse for the city's development came from the port. To this day, Hong Kong is one of the most important economic centers of the world. This is significant, no? Like, the idea that um, th there's a stronghold there. You know, you control the port. You control basically a door to what's coming in and going out. So this isn't just about transport. This is political. This is social. This is ideological. The way in which harbors were built in their day can clearly be seen in La Rochelle, the port city in southern France. During the Middle Ages, the old harbor of La Rochelle was transformed by Templars into the Atlantic coast's biggest port. Often, harbors also served as fortifications. They offered protection for the towns behind them. Two ancient defense towers secured the port entrance. During the late Middle Ages, a heavy iron chain was stretched between the towers to block entry for sailboats. Today, the old harbor of La Rochelle is a tourist attraction. In the industrial age, it was mainly workers and seafarers who put their stamp on old port towns. They developed into spots with a very particular charm. Ports were the gateway to the world, not just for sailors, but also for travelers. You know, interestingly, for our cultures, our societies, ports weren't just about moving things from point A and point B. They were about connection. They were about difference, they were about negotiation, all of these things. The whole notion of a port, of course, was was people from different communities, from different countries, connecting and speaking. This was sort of very, very important. Usually, the port was a region's largest employer. People settled close by, and the seaport typical pubs and drinking holes took hold. So as sort of uh, the rules of economics and supply and demand tend to dictate, uh, typically speaking, where you have areas where men are coming back from being out at sea with just other men, uh, and they come back to land, they probably have various wants and needs that um, have not been fulfilled, and there are usually plenty of women looking for work, and so uh, it, I, I guess prostitution and red light districts were sort of a, a very unsurprising result of, of a poor city. It was in harbors where famous maritime explorers started their daring expeditions, which completely changed the world view of that time. It was called the Age of Discovery, when we were sending all these ships around the world and starting to discover, you know, things like the Americas with, with Columbus, um, and even the first uh, person to, to sail all the way around the world. Um, that massively shaped how we saw the world, that we saw it as a globe, it is a globe, Flat Earthers, um, and uh, and really made us define what the continents are and and see the bigger picture. I mean, it's fascinating. Vasco da Gama was the first to prove that India could be reached by sea. For the longest time, it was believed that the Indian Ocean was an inland sea, and that there was no connection between the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. But on the eighth of July, fourteen ninety seven, da Gama set sail from Lisbon. He steers his fleet eastwards through the Atlantic and circumnavigates the stormy Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa. Sailing along the East African coastline, he finally reaches the Indian Ocean and the port town of Calicut after 10 months at sea. The sea route to India had been discovered. 
the numerous expeditions and seaborne trade demanded new sea routes, like the Suez Canal, for example, which is part of the Maritime Silk Road and forms the boundary between Africa and Asia. Until the 19th century, ships from Europe had to sail around the entire African continent to reach India and the Far East. The dream of building a canal that connects the Mediterranean with the Red Sea and thereby dramatically shortening this journey has been around for ages. Long before, the ancient Egyptians tried to conquer the desert, but the construction of a waterway failed. The canal silted up. Nor was this ambitious project realized under Napoleon. His surveyors, after making some miscalculations, deemed the project unfeasible. The handy thing about the Suez Canal, uh, say compared to something like the Panama Canal, is that um, the Red Sea and the Mediterranean are at almost identical level. And so that means that you could just sort of dig a channel between the two and you wouldn't have to worry about you know, a strong current going from one to the other. Um, so it didn't require locks or anything else. The elaborate construction work didn't get underway until 1859. French engineer Ferdinand de Lesseps took up the initiative to build the canal. It was the biggest construction project of its time, in the middle of the desert and far from any kind of infrastructure. The construction of the Suez Canal, it was an absolutely huge undertaking. Um, early on, actually, they were using a lot of forced labour. They had a problem of delivering um, water to all of the workers. Um, they had something like 1,500 camels trying to do that, um, you know, and they did try and improve the situation. It wasn't great, but thousands uh, are thought to have died. And there was, in particular, a number of cholera outbreaks that were causing some of those deaths. Um, yeah, not, it was not a great undertaking. After 10 years of construction, the canal was opened in 1869. Despite the sad circumstances, Ferdinand de Lesseps had achieved a masterful feat in the barren desert, an invaluable shipping shortcut amounting to 7,000 kilometers between east and west. To this day, the Suez Canal is considered the world's most important water corridor. Thanks to this shortcut, the number of ships traveling the seas kept climbing. Up until the mid-19th century, they were carried over the oceans by sail. An invention then led to a dramatic change in ships themselves. So with the invention of uh, steam-powered um, ships, that massively opened the world to, to, to more ships and navigation. Um, because, you know, think back to the, the sail ships and you're heavily dependent on the wind, its direction, uh, as to whether you can actually go. Um, and so that eliminated that factor. You were able to go anywhere you wanted, um, whenever you wanted. It really just opened the floodgates. The advantage was that steam engines delivered constant power for the journey. This made it possible to calculate reliable shipping times. Steamboats revolutionized the world market because now the time constraint of transporting goods was less of an issue, which meant that we got to experience products that would never have reached us in the time that it takes to cross the seas. So steam engines were obviously a, a, a big step forward in terms of energy efficiency because uh, they, they ran off coal, which is a very energy dense fuel source as opposed to something like wood. But the trouble with, with steam engines is that they take up a lot of space. And even more so, uh, the coal that they require to run off, that takes up even more space. And, and they would often take up, together, that would take up almost a third of a ship's uh, cargo hold. Since steamships also served as emigrant ships, this lack of space didn't just affect goods. Up to the late 19th century, it was primarily Europeans who left their homes in search of a new life in America. Conditions aboard the ships were still very cramped in the beginning. But the steamships heralded a new era here too. They enabled passengers to cross the Atlantic in just 20 days or so. This made transport cheaper and more affordable for wider sections of the population. Mm. 
At the beginning of the 19th century, large passenger ships were still used primarily as a means of transportation. But since it wasn't possible to book a passage for the winter months, they accrued losses for the shipping lines. Albert Ballin, a Hamburg-based ship owner, came up with the groundbreaking idea of using the ships for pleasure cruises in warmer climes. In 1891, he dispatched the Augusta Victoria to the Mediterranean with 241 passengers. This was the beginning of cruise trips. Up to the mid-1930s, luxury cruises became increasingly popular. Larger and faster ships were built to accommodate more and more passengers. Freight ships also grew in size, and the huge increase in goods necessitated more dock workers at the ports to load and unload these goods. These so-called stevedores tried to distribute the ship's cargo as quickly as possible. Occasionally, however, the cargo had spoiled during the journey. There were some wonderful advancements that, that came out of necessity. So, you know, people realize they can transport oceans, they can transport relatively quickly, but of course, when it comes to fresh fruits and vegetables, quick is, is never really quick enough. You know, they, they only last a few days. So that's until we see the refrigeration of compartments. At the time, you need to remember that this would have been heralded as, as a huge victory in terms of sort of um, human and commercial progress. With the invention of refrigerated vessels, now even perishable goods, such as bananas or meat, could be transported. The luxury goods of the time finally became available to everyone. But there's one invention that would revolutionize the port and the entire global economy along with it. Prior to this invention, goods were still unloaded piece by piece a time-consuming undertaking. They'd unload goods almost individually, uh, and that has a problem depending on, on weather conditions, right? Uh, you know, if, if it's raining, snowing, windy, then you could damage the items. So they'd actually kind of had to halt everything at the port, and they wouldn't be able to do anything. You know, they would be sitting around waiting for the sun to come out. That's nuts. Loading and unloading was connected with long waiting times in general. Exactly this is what he wanted to change in 1856. American freight forwarder Malcolm McLean. So there was this guy, Malcolm McLean, uh, who started out as a truck driver, but as he was you know, going about his, his shipping business, he realized it was really inefficient to uh, always, you know, drive up with the truck, open it up, empty all the goods out in one of the, the sort of individual pallets and then reload them into another truck. He was like, well, why don't we just detach the whole thing, stick that on the boat, and then put that onto a new truck. McLean evolved his mobile truck trailer idea. Loading the entire truck trailer along with the chassis onto a ship was inefficient. There had to be a simpler method. What if we had a standardized, you know, shape of box container and then you could just move it off a ship onto a truck and then load it to wherever it needed to go? Now, this seems like genius now, but at the time, people were like, well, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Like, uh, that's why you do that. But he, like, like most people that actually, you know, end up really sort of succeeding in business, sticks to his idea. He has that grit. He kind of believes in what he's doing. So he can't get funding. He can't get a loan. So what does he do? He sells up all of his business, whatever he's doing at the time, and invests all the money by himself into developing a container. He also had a Navy tanker converted into a container ship and sent it from Newark to Texas with 58 containers aboard. The steel boxes attracted attention and copycats. McLean had created a standardized box. To this day, it has the same exact dimensions all over the world. A standard container measures 20 feet, approximately 6 meters. The so-called 20-foot equivalent unit is abbreviated as TEU. It is the same shape and size that we see today, and it fits exactly on a truck, so you're able to move it off and move it on, and, and it kind of, in some ways, changes the face of shipping. Standardizing the boxes changed everything because it meant that loading and unloading became a much more simple process. As a result, everything got more efficient and less costly. The downside of that was that labor intensity decreased, which is often the case with 
technology. Before containers were introduced, work at the docks was very strenuous. Heavy goods were offloaded from ships and transported to warehouses using sack barrows. Technological advances, along with the advent of the container, dramatically changed working conditions. Goods no longer needed to be taken to a warehouse, since the container itself functioned as a mobile storage shed. It also was more secure as well, because it meant you could put a completely sealed container um, and know that, you know, keep it locked the entire time, and then you don't have to worry about uh, the ship's crew getting into it, drinking whatever it contains, you know, if it contains liquor. Uh, so it was a really cool idea. But it would take until the late 60s for the first container ships to reach the ports and usher in a new era. Ports needed to adapt to new requirements that went hand in hand with containers. Modern gantry cranes were installed on the quays. The old, small-scale port facilities were no longer suited for container transshipment. What was needed now was large, contained areas to stack the shipping containers. And above all, the role of technology took on ever-increasing importance. All the operating procedures and all the container movements are monitored by an EDP sensor, from which shipping companies can always get the latest information. And an entirely new type of ship was developed. The so-called container ships not only had a different shape, they also had larger loading hatches than the previous bulk freighters. In the 60s, ships pulled out of port with 500 containers. In the meantime, their capacity has grown rapidly. Especially over the past 15 years, their loading capacity has skyrocketed to the extent that a new, biggest ship is launched somewhere in the world every year. Today, these floating heavyweights are more than 60 meters wide and 400 meters long. And there's no end in sight to this development. Now, with the introduction of shipping containers, what you're seeing is, is the development of an economy of scale with, um, with the port industry and with the shipping industry. The more stuff you're able to send in mass, the cheaper everything gets. You know, the labor goes down, um, the, the cost per item goes down. It just makes everything more efficient. These ever bigger ships have become a real challenge for ports. The greater their draft and width, the more difficult it becomes to maneuver these super ships. Controlling ship traffic is a complex job. Without the navigators in the Vessel Traffic Service Center, ports will be paralyzed. Great ship widths pose a challenge, but the real issue is often the ship's draft. Many ports aren't deep enough to accommodate very large vessels. Various restrictions apply for unusually large vessels. A traffic separation scheme is in place to avoid the risk of collision. And we coordinate vessel traffic to ensure that approaching vessels can do so efficiently, safely and smoothly. The OOCL France, with its 366 meters in length, is among the very large container ships. Navigating a vessel this size is a real challenge for maritime pilots. Anything 340 meters or longer, or 46 meters wide, requires two pilots. One person alone can't keep an eye on everything. On this ship, for example, there are 120 meters in front of me, but I also have 240 meters behind me. If I pass a small vessel, I have to go outside, look down and see if I can pass safely. While I'm doing that, I can't properly focus on my piloting duties because I'm located at the ship's side, when actually I should be in the middle in order to pilot the ship. A mega vessel can only be guided into an inland port safely and smoothly with the help of local tug captains who know the water's vagaries. So, despite all the advances made, the responsibility of pilots has actually grown. 
The expanding tonnage of vessels has changed our profession and increased our scope of responsibility. Pilots used to just direct the course of one small vessel. These mega vessels, whether container ships or passenger ships, really strain the dimensions of many ports. Keeping a comprehensive overview of everything is absolutely crucial. When it comes to passenger ships, too, the shipping companies are always vying to outdo one another with the biggest, fastest, or most luxurious ship. The cruise ship boom has been going on since the 70s. During this time, not only have the ships become bigger, everything about them has changed. Cruise ships look more and more like small towns. In addition to room and board, they offer a wide range of leisure activities. Sea cruises are a new branch of the tourist industry leading to bigger and bigger ocean liners. These can be around 360 meters in length and carry almost 7,000 passengers. This incredible growth entails consequences. Cities are completely overwhelmed with the surge of tourists. More than 600 cruise ships with 1.5 million tourists on board more in Venice every year. Thus far, the giant passenger ships have been able to pull right up to the dock and give their guests a magnificent view of the sights. But environmentalists and those trying to preserve local cultures and traditions fear for the delicate ecological balance in the lagoon. In the meantime, the city has reacted. Since 2019, cruise ships have been banned from the historical center of Venice. It's the same with container ships. They too have become so big that many harbors can no longer accommodate them. Cruise ship operators from all over are advocating waterway development programs, but they're facing resistance from nature conservation organizations that fear serious consequences for the ecosystem. Often enough, however, commercial interests are able to override environmental concerns. Many things need to be taken into consideration before dredging shipping channels to enable accommodation of larger vessels. To prevent the current and the water level from changing, for example, the excavated soil must be deposited at another spot. The river is also being widened. Works like this, in the end, add up to several million euros. Fairway adjustment is fairly common, the Panama Canal being the most prominent example. The Panama Canal, too, had reached its capacity by the late 20th century. It was neither wide nor deep enough for the colossal new ships. The canal was built at the end of the 19th century and inaugurated in 1914. At this time, no one could have envisioned today's mega-sized cruise ships and super tankers. The 82-kilometer-long Panama Canal is one of the world's most important waterways. It links the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. This direct route lets ships bypass the treacherous Cape Horn or the Straits of Magellan at the southern tip of South America. The Panama Canal was really big for world trade. I mean, so this is allowing you to easily access between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. So this was great for, for trade. It was also great for Panama itself because they could charge people to go through and they made a lot of money that way. Before the extension, Panama collected a billion dollars per year from ships that transit the canal. This makes the canal Panama's most important source of income and also the reason why it had to adapt to the new ships. So, some 100 years after the big opening, this canal too needed to be expanded and have new locks installed to be able to keep up with the growing volume of ships. Since 2016, ships with a freight container volume of up to 14,000 containers can now be accommodated. You can actually see that the, the advent of these large shipping containers and then the, the larger ships that carry tons of these shipping containers has, has really affected the ports as well because you can imagine that the old-timey ports, they're so small that these big ships would not even fit. So it's, it's driven the expansion of the ports themselves to be able to, to have that capacity to enable those ships to come in, to be able to deal with the amount of shipping containers that we're talking about being transferred between, between cities. I mean, it's, it's, it's grown explosively almost. The Arabs lead the way. They are investing billions into the expansion of their ports. 
The best example can be seen in Dubai. Taking its cue from Palm Islands, the port of Dubai, port of Yebel Ali, was also built in the ocean. Yebel Ali is in the top 10 of international ports. Dubai is planning to surpass the ports of Shanghai and Singapore by 2030, and then advance to the world's largest port. We have a master plan to 2030 that we can grow up to 70 million TEU capacity. So yes, we have the land reserved, we have the sea to reserved, and it's just a matter of whenever we see the need is there, as soon as we see that business is growing, that demand is there, we build ahead of the demand, just to make sure that uh, we are making sure that the cargo is flowing smoothly, and also our partners, shipping lines, and the traders and businessmen are enjoying the growth and they can grow with us as well. Terminal 2 was inaugurated in 2007. A short time later, construction began for Terminal 3, which opened in 2014. Terminal 4 opened soon, thereby bringing container turnover capacity to 22.4 million annually. Ship owners have enormous power because without trade to a harbour, a city loses revenue. And so ship owners would have the upper hand in deciding where they wanted to trade. And if a port didn't allow them to trade there, they would just move on to somewhere else. So it was extremely important that harbours expanded to accommodate all ship owners. Like no other city, Shanghai exemplifies the development of port cities. An economic hub today, Shanghai used to be a fishing village. Thanks to its outstanding location near the Yangtze Delta, Shanghai quickly grew into a vibrant port city. Cotton, silk, porcelain and tea were shipped around the world from here. This is where the city's pulse could be felt, at a port right in the town center. In the 30s, ships docked right at the Bund, Shanghai's legendary riverfront esplanade with its banks and magnificent hotels. The evolution of Shanghai is typical for many large port cities. As the ports expand, they retreat far from the city centers. These days, ships can no longer moor along Shanghai's waterside promenade. You have to kind of imagine the difference between sort of that bustling port with people shouting and workmen and, and you know, all of that kind of energy to now, where you kind of just see things being moved around automatically. You, you, you actually can look around for, for, you know, swaths of areas and not see that many people at all. Today, Shanghai has the world's biggest port. About 40 million containers are moved from land to ship and vice versa every year. Ships are loaded and discharged here at altogether 10 different terminals. The most significant part of the port facility is its deep water port Yangshan, 90 miles to the south. Up to 50 ships can berth at the same time along its 11 kilometer long wharfage. Opened in 2017, this terminal is the world's first fully automated facility. Driverless vehicles and robots have almost completely taken over the work of people. At most ports today, there are only few, if any, people who still operate the gantry cranes that move the steel boxes. About 40 containers need to be shifted per hour. Crane operators definitely notice the increase in vessel size, as in Hamburg. There's definitely more work, especially with these ship types that we have in front of us. You get the feeling there's no end to the work. They hold so many containers, and it takes forever to unload and reload them. Gantry crane operators work on a piece rate basis, but will this be enough to keep up with the heavy volume? Transshipment of the containers is fully automated even now. I'm convinced that machines won't be replacing us as drivers anytime soon. In many situations, we're faster and take better action than machines. The machines we have work in a very linear, boxy way. We drive faster and more determinedly. 
So I don't agree that our jobs as drivers are at stake anytime soon. However, there are already remote controlled gantry cranes like here in Rotterdam. Human beings can't be seen on the terminal grounds anywhere. The so-called control room is located in the nearby office building. This is where seven people working in shifts monitor all the harbor operations. The gantry crane operators are in the next room. Especially for them, automation was a cultural shift. Up until a few years ago, they worked high above the container shift in the crane cabin. Now they unload the containers virtually in front of a monitor. I do miss uh, being in the crane because of the movement. Once you get used to it, I liked it even with a storm. With very high winds, the crane moved a lot, and uh, yeah, it was great. And you don't have that here, but uh, this is, it's, it's different. It's the same, but it's different. So uh, yeah, I like this because of the challenge. The gantry crane operators can no longer peer down through a glass floor to see the containers. They have to rely on monitors and the various camera perspectives. That took the most time getting used to, the, the judging the distance. So you're much more careful uh, than I was on the other side. Not that I wasn't careful there, but um, yeah, it, it, it took a bit of time getting used to. And uh, now, now I have no problem, but it is, uh, you have to, again, I say, you rely on your, your meters, your height meters, and all the safety features which uh, are built into the crane. They help me do my job safely. The highly automated terminal employs about 500 people, but this number is decreasing and there's no end in sight of the automation process. Today, the immediate colleagues of the crane operators are machines. So-called automated guided vehicles, or AGVs, have revolutionized the ports. As if by magic, they drive around the port, transporting containers from the crane to the block warehouses. Armin Wieschmann helped develop the AGV system with a team of specialists. Various sensor systems come into play and enable the AGV to maneuver fully automatically on the harbor grounds. We installed two large transponder antennae in the front and back. These antennae communicate with transponders that have been installed in the AGV driving surface. So when the antennae bearing vehicle moves across a transponder, the transponder transmits its info. Which transponder am I? Where am I located exactly? To the antenna. The antenna in turn transmits the data to a navigation computer that's located in this control cabinet. Some 20,000 transponders have been installed grid-like into the surface. The AGV needs to know the path to take, but also how to evade other transporters. The vehicles don't communicate with one another, but rather via a higher level system that specifies the route for each of the vehicles. This route should be optimally chosen, so the containers get from the gantry crane to the warehouse crane and vice versa via the shortest route. But the greatest achievement is the vehicle battery. To recharge, they drive autonomously to the changing station where the battery is replaced within minutes. These vehicles thus play a big role in reducing harmful emissions at the port. And now specialists have even managed to program the AGVs to get their batteries recharged when green electricity is particularly plentiful in the power grid. With the help of AGVs, the amount of carbon dioxide in Hamburg is to be reduced by 10,000s of tons. The goal is to turn the port into a transshipment point with zero emissions. Meanwhile, work on the next innovation is already underway. With the help of digitalization and AI, autonomous ships will be navigating the harbor and make for even smoother operations. Vincent Wegener is heavily involved in this project. Together with the port operator, he outfitted a patrol boat with numerous measuring devices. This is actually our test vessel. It's called the, the Floating Lab, and uh, the Port of Rotterdam has, uh, well, has given us the opportunity to make use of this vessel to, uh, to test our software. 
The eight cameras that are installed in the boat provide a 360-degree view. Radar and GPS transmit its position. To start with, the floating lab will harvest all kinds of data. The collected data will be used to program the algorithms efficiently, a process that will be subject to ongoing optimization as the virtual captain is trained. Various scenarios are being tested. The virtual vessel will have to navigate in heavy swells, storms or snow, and also know how to evade other objects. Well, using a, a digital captain has, has several advantages. So one of them, of course, is that uh, the digital captain never gets tired. So Captain AI is always there to, to either to train or to do the work. Uh, never gets drunk, um, and therefore uh, it's also more more scalable. So you can use the technology on, on all the ships based on one algorithm, and that's uh, that's something a human cannot do. We cannot transfer our knowledge in in one on one, right? You need to train as a human being like 20 years to become a senior captain. Uh, but our our digital captain will just learn from all the all the other boats and all the data that comes in, and there's one big super brain getting smarter every day. Autonomous ships, are they the future for our ports? What role will humans still play? Will the ports be able to dispense with them at one point? I'm not sure if, if ports are going to be without completely any human interventions. I think we've seen with other industries that, that when you increase the level of autonomy, it just changes the jobs that humans do. So there will always be some level of human oversight in, in some capacity. Now, that may be that they're not even sat at the port anymore and that they're, they're at some sort of remote location and watching on cameras or, or, or whatever. But I, I think there will still have to be a human element involved in some sense. There's no way that the robots are going to be doing absolutely everything. So what does the future look like for the harbour? How far can these processes be optimised? There are still some disruptive factors that could cancel the port's cost concept very abruptly. A ship repair that becomes necessary, for example. Often this would force a ship owner to wait a long time for spare parts that need to be brought in from another part of the world. In Rotterdam, there's a place where startup businesses and students deal with exactly this problem, the RDM grounds. The former shipyard has evolved into an innovation cluster for the port. Vincent Wegener runs his labs here too. He believes he's found a solution for the problem, namely by printing the necessary spare parts with a 3D printer. A robot welding arm will be programmed with the corresponding dimensions. Layer for layer, high-grade metals will then be applied. The, the main benefits of printing parts over other technologies like, uh, like forging or, or casting is that you can print parts uh, the amount you need, when you need them, and where you need them. So the idea is you can print locally. You don't have to wait on your shipment from China or India. You just print it where you need it, here in Rotterdam, for instance. You don't need to have any warehousing anymore because you will only need to print what you are actually going to use. So there are many advantages for 3D printing. With this technology, Vincent Wegener and his team managed to print the world's first licensed ship's propeller. A metal piece made of aluminium, nickel and copper with a diameter of one meter and a weight of 400 kilograms. We have seen that there is a big demand for, for making parts on demand. If we can fulfill that role, then the Port of Rotterdam has a new role as, as, as a provider of those, uh, of those parts. And we foresee also a future where you have hubs around the world like Singapore, Houston, Rotterdam, uh, and you know, you can get there, your parts over there at these hubs. A new task for the port. He's trying to take advantage of 3D printing as an additional service to offer. 
So with the advent of, of 3D printing almost everywhere, um, you can see that that's obviously going to go to, to ports and harbors as well. So I, you know, I see that that's really going to expand um, in the future. The port has undergone a transformation that has no equal. At one time, it was a place of yearning and the employer for an entire region. At terminals today, everything is about efficiency, time and costs. If you take a look at how much of the work there is now automated and how quickly that's happened, you see that that's probably a sign of things to come in other industries. We owe one of our greatest inventions to the ambition of a truck driver. You can sense and experience innovations more intensively at a port than anywhere else. They are what made globalization and turbo capitalism possible in the first place. Nowadays, I can find some really cheap gadget that I can get from China, have it in a few weeks time, and I've only spent a couple of pounds uh, on it, you know, and, and that's, that's absolutely nuts. And the more people are going to be doing stuff like that, it's going to increase the demand for bigger ships, for, for, for more ships traveling uh, as we just get more and more consumerized. It's about cost reduction through economies of scale. This also applies to passenger shipping with unforeseen consequences for the environment. Looking at the port is like a glimpse into the future, a future that will change our lives dramatically.